Since the beginning, remakes have been a part of video game history, often driven by nostalgia, Rebuilding a beloved concept using more advanced technology can result in new experiences that satisfy fans and newcomers alike. It doesn't always work out, mind you, but when it does, the results can be remarkable. And Capcom is certainly no stranger to capitalizing on the idea of a remake. Perhaps its best-known remake first appeared in 2002 when the Japanese publisher unleashed Resident Evil on Nintendo GameCube, raising the bar forever in the process. With a completely overhauled visual style, new gameplay systems, and a reworked mansion layout, it truly delivered a brand new experience, which also happens to pay tribute to the original Resident Evil. It was so successful that fans began to hope that one day, Resident Evil 2, one of the best games in the series, would receive similar treatment. That day is today. Resident Evil 2 has been completely remade from scratch for a new generation, and the results are extremely impressive. For this video, I'll be your guide through the world of Resident Evil 2. We'll explore this new game, checking out its impressive visuals in the process while discussing its design changes and drawing direct comparisons with the PlayStation original. So join me once again as we return to the world of survival horror. A lot has changed since 1998 when the original Resident Evil 2 was first released on Sony PlayStation. Computing power has increased dramatically, while new gameplay styles have become possible and the franchise itself has continued to evolve. When the first Resident Evil received its remake, pre-rendered backgrounds were still a common solution designed to increase scene detail beyond what was possible to render in real time. It worked, but more than 20 years after Resident Evil 2 first shipped, this new remake takes a completely different approach. Built on Capcom's in-house RE engine, Resident Evil 2 plays out entirely in 3D with a freely movable camera system. In many ways, the game feels like a fusion between Resident Evil 4's faster-paced gameplay with the original design and flow of Resident Evil 2. There's even a sense that it resembles, somewhat at least, the Resident Evil 4 pre-release version of the game that was cancelled after the game was rebooted. While the camera angles differ, the flashlight mechanics resemble the Resident Evil 2 we're playing today. Either way, such a dramatic shift suggests a very different experience then, but while playing, I was impressed with how the team has managed to weave in the original game while expanding the world and mechanics. To better appreciate the evolution then, let us walk through both games starting right at the beginning. Resident Evil 2 starts with a lengthy full motion video sequence portraying Leon or Claire arriving in Raccoon City. Using Leon's disc as a basis for our comparison then, he enters Raccoon City by Jeep before uncovering a dead body strewn out across the road. He stops to investigate. The game then cuts to a gas station where a truck driver, bitten by a zombie, climbs back into his rig and drives away. And this is our first major change. In the remake, the game opens with the trucker enjoying a burger while listening to the radio before colliding with someone he believes to be alive. He climbs out and checks on her, which is exactly what Leon does in the original FMV sequence. It's as if they've switched places. All of this is rendered in real time now at 60 frames per second, unlike the original video sequence. From this point, we jump over to Leon, driving into town in his Jeep, but this time, he's the one that visits the gas station, and it's here where players first assume control. It's a nice twist that immediately demonstrates the type of changes you'll encounter along the way. It also gives us a good idea of what we can expect visually. But before we begin playing, I want to talk about the brightness. You see, this is a game where you will need to calibrate properly before playing. When playing in SDR, the included calibration tools do a fairly good job of this, with the result producing a suitable image. In HDR, however, I found it difficult to achieve the level of blackness that a horror game like this should offer. I attempted to compensate for this by lowering the brightness on my display a couple notches, but 
this isn't something anyone should have to do and I feel there needs to be additional calibration options when using HDR. There's some other issues with the brightness, but I'll touch on that later. Once you find a suitable image here though, we can begin to explore. Resident Evil 2 makes a strong first impression. Running at a smooth 60 frames per second, this first scene depicts a thunderstorm encircling this lone gas station on the highway. Electric lights illuminate the scene, realistic materials are used throughout to great effect, Leon's clothing, initially dry, becomes wet when walking out from under the awning, and realistic dynamic shadows are cast from light sources. The only complaint at this point is the unrealistic specular highlights from the headlamps which, from this angle, should be occluded from view. A minor oversight. Leon then moves inside the building, picking up a flashlight along the way, which is another shift in game design. Due to the dynamic nature of the world, Leon can illuminate dark areas while smoothly filtered shadows dance across the environment. This sort of dynamic lighting would have been difficult to achieve back on the PlayStation using pre-rendered graphics, though there are games which offered something similar. As we continue through the gas station, objects lie in the shelves with bespoke models and textures, lending the scene an extra sense of detail and density. Then as you encounter the first zombie, unloading a few rounds into his head reveals surprisingly natural hit reactions to each shot before the zombie collapses into a heap. We quickly finish up in this area before heading back outside to be greeted by this familiar scene. The location has changed, but Leon encounters Claire in much the same way as the original game. The animation and camera work has been refined here, but it's neat to see how the two versions stack up. From this point, Leon and Claire make for a squad car and begin their journey into the city. The two hold a conversation in the car, which continues to highlight the massive leap in rendering quality on display. To think that this original pre-rendered FMV would have taken so much time to render out back in the day, but now we can have this glorious new version running in real time at 60 frames per second. It's rather impressive. Eventually though, their journey comes to an end and we're dropped into the city next to this fiery wreck. So both games begin here on the streets with zombies shambling towards Leon. The only requirement is to survive, you can take out the zombies if you like, but it's not a great idea in a game about ammo conservation. The construction of the scene is rather different between the two games, but the feeling is the same. And hey, there's a restaurant here in both versions if you're hungry. Visually, the remake features a larger open city block with lots of destroyed cars, fire, and wet pavement everywhere, and it shows off the game's excellent material system. The contrast between wet, shiny pavement and the metal, stone, and cloth featured elsewhere is rather effective. There's plenty of dynamic lights in the scene and lots of specular highlights, not to mention screen space reflections, a visual feature which presents mixed results depending on the scene, which we'll discuss later. It's already at this point though that the two games begin to diverge. The police station is the objective, but the path to get there differs. In the original, players must cross through Kendo's gun shop where he initially holds up Leon at gunpoint before the situation is defused. Of course, once you leave the scene, poor Kendo doesn't last much longer. Now, Kendo's gun shop does still appear in the final game, and that's something that's been discussed in various previews, but it occurs at a much later point. And of course, Robert Kendo is still there in the remake and holds you up at gunpoint once again, though the encounter plays out rather differently in the remake, which I won't spoil here. His character model sure has come a long way. While Kendo himself only first appeared in Resident Evil 2, there was another character known as John that appeared in the cancelled Resident Evil 2 or Resident Evil 1.5 that shared his model. So we've come a long way, I think. So rather than crossing through the gun store in the remake, Leon moves down a similar alley but comes across a set of stairs instead. Down here, I did note some rather nice texture work on these bricks. It's not using palm, but I still like the material here. But if we continue, you'll be greeted by another large open street. The original also features a busy street just outside the police station, but the approach differs slightly. There is a bus in both games, I should note, but one is a yellow school bus and you cannot enter the bus, so it's not really comparable. So the approach to the police station then. In the original, you approach from the side of the station. You could walk across this yard here, or go down these steps, walk through this passageway, then come up on the other side. Both of these paths lead to the entrance. 
In the remake, however, you approach from the front, and while those stairs are still present here on each side, you cannot use them, they are barred off. Instead, you approach from the front gate, which, interestingly enough, was already rendered in the original game, it's just that it was locked and surrounded by zombies. This time, however, you use it. It's a minor thing, but it shows how the game has been kind of remixed in this new version. Now if we jump back to those stairs I mentioned before, you can't use them in Scenario A, but after you finish the game the first time and play Scenario B, however, you do get to use those stairs and go down through the tunnel. Which is, of course, different from the Scenario B present in the original game as well. So again, it's been remixed. Now if we jump back over to Leon then, the puddles here outside the police station reveal the issue I have with screen space reflections in many scenes. They appear extremely grainy as a result of the selected rendering method, something which becomes even more noticeable in later areas in the game. And it's a problem across all versions of the game, though the PC version minimizes the effect as you'll see in Alex's upcoming PC video. But now it's time to enter the police station. Welcome to the Raccoon City Police Station. As we enter the station, a subtle remix of the original tune plays quietly in the background. It feels just right, but a lot has changed. One of the first changes I noticed is this. The second floor is now accessible by a set of stairs. In the original, this is not the case. Instead, you lower a ladder at a later point, granting easier access to the balcony. The central desk area with the computer then has moved around, door mechanisms and designs have changed, and the statue has moved as well. Fast forwarding slightly, this is one of many examples of how puzzle design has been modified in the remake. In the original game, you'll need to locate and use the unicorn medallion here, which then produces the spade key. In the remake, however, you'll need to find three medallions to activate the statue, and upon doing so, it reveals a path to the next area instead. Before we continue with our tour though, let's take a moment to appreciate what's on display in this area. Volumetric light shafts stream in from above. These effects appear to be rendered at a lower resolution, perhaps even quarter res, relying on filtering to produce acceptable results, but it looks really good nonetheless. The entryway then is packed with detailed assets with an ample geometry budget. Arches are nicely rounded throughout while incidental details receive lots of care. Materials are realistic overall. The floor material, for instance, is suitably shiny with impressively sharp detail while these medical curtains are properly diffuse. Same goes for this filthy damaged cardboard box, which contrasts nicely against the increased specularity on the packing tape. With so many shiny materials then, reflections play a key role. Box projected cube maps appear to be used in conjunction with screen space reflections. This entry area further demonstrates the limitations of the selected SSR method however, with a lot of visible noise present throughout the scene. On a positive note though, Leon's in-game model is fantastic. His luscious hair is beautifully rendered and bounces realistically as he moves. Subsurface scattering is applied to his skin, while Leon's bulging veins appear clearly visible across his hands. At this early point in the game, then, he's still wearing his street clothes, but again, his jacket material is realistic, as are his blue jeans. Claire's model is equally high quality, and showcases some remarkably detailed hair rendering, along with realistic jacket leather and accessories around her waist. And did you notice how the strap holder on the Uzi moves around based on position as well? Both characters have a multitude of unlockable and alternative outfits, including Elsa Walker's outfit, a nod to the cancelled version of Resident Evil 2. Claire and Leon have their original outfits from the PlayStation version as well, which is a nice touch. There's plenty of other characters in the game too, all of which showcase the engine and artist's capabilities. The trucker at the very beginning of the game, for instance, features an unbelievably detailed beard, devoid of any of the typical hair rendering artifacts we've seen in other games such as Final Fantasy XV. This holds true for all the characters in the game, each of which are beautifully designed and rendered by the engine. Between this and Devil May Cry 5, Capcom is really flexing its character design muscles, I feel, with some of the most realistically rendered digital humans we've seen this generation. 
Okay, so moving back to our comparison then, one of the first things you do in the original game is enter this door, triggering a cutscene featuring an injured Marvin. He hands you his card key, allowing you to re-enter the main hall, where it becomes possible to open these two locked doors. We then proceed through this door into the waiting room and continue onward. Now in the remake, things play out differently. After checking out a security cam with this gorgeous scanline simulation, which is a little odd for an LCD screen, you're alerted to an officer in trouble. You then make your way through this door in the remake, which is normally locked in the original game until after speaking with Marvin. While now out of sync, we can at least draw comparisons between the two. In the original, this area is well lit and more linear in design, I suppose. The vending machines and plants are still present here in the remake, but it's more dilapidated and partially flooded now. The press room is also accessible from this side of the hallway, which makes more sense logically speaking. If you look at the map of this area, you'll notice plenty of similarities, but the subtle changes to the layout have an impact on the overall game flow. The flashlight mechanics also come into play here, which highlights an issue with the game's color grading. Many darker areas such as this raise the black level as you transition between the two zones. Perhaps this is designed to simulate a misty appearance, but it's not optimal on a display with great black levels such as an OLED. You'd want a darker tone here, and you really cannot fix this with the in-game calibration since it changes between areas. This area is perhaps the worst defender I've found in the game, but that doesn't mean it's not distracting. Eventually though, we continue our way through this hallway and reach an officer just as he's ripped to shreds. Zombies then begin their attack, and you need to make your way back out into the main hall where Marvin pulls you out of the frying pan just in time. This is where you meet him now. And it's a great way to highlight the impressive facial work on display here. Without even hearing the dialogue, you can still read their expressions just by looking at their facial movements. You gain a better understanding of what's happening through it. This is especially evident in their eyes. Just look at them as they speak. It feels very natural to me. Once the cutscene is over though, we have the option of visiting the waiting room where the two versions sync up once again. At this point, a significant change to the game flow should be evident by now. The entire world is seamless. Loading screens between rooms have been eliminated. In the original, a 60 FPS door animation is used between these areas, but it is now entirely absent. And I feel that this improves the flow of the game overall, but I was concerned that it might ruin the game's balance. After all, enemy placement is handled on a per area basis. This is key to the core design of the game, and thankfully, the remake does maintain this for the most part. Like the original, enemies are typically confined to specific zones, but in a neat twist, certain enemy types can now break through certain doors. Thankfully, save rooms are typically safe from invasion, and enemies tend to stay confined to their areas, which genuinely is a benefit in terms of overall game design. Speaking of enemy behavior, I do appreciate how zombies sometimes interact with the scenery itself, like this for instance, where the zombie sort of stumbles over the top of this desk. Now if we jump back to our comparison, let's look at the west hallway area of the first floor. Again, the original is brightly lit compared to the remake. The original game also has this surprise, the reveal of the liquor, an iconic moment for sure, and one that does not occur in the remake. The liquor makes his first appearance a tad later in a different way, which I won't spoil here. As we continue down the hall, note again that the hallway is seamless in the remake, but divided by a loading door in the original release. There's also a nice example of volumetric light shafts present at the end of the hall on the remake side. Now, the map differs here in the original. You can continue freely down the hallway into the next area, but in the remake, you have to go through the operations room, so let's do that. Similar design, but clearly much more detailed in the remake. And there's a new exit that you need to use to bypass the hallway, which you do by climbing through here. Again, this is not necessary in the original. Now the area outside this room varies significantly from the original game. There are more doors to access here with some cool new rooms created for this version, including this locker area on the ground floor, which holds plenty of goodies. Now, if we continue from there, we eventually arrive near the area with the back steps, which leads us towards another save room. And this room is very similar between the two. 
the dark room is present back here, and the room layout is basically identical. So now that we're in this safe room, let's take a moment to appreciate another set of options available in the new game, the audio options. And there are two features here I want to talk about. Firstly, Resident Evil 2 supports real-time binaural audio. But what is it? Well, a binaural recording is typically created using a head mic, which places microphones within the ear canals of a fake head. The idea is that it simulates the way sound works when entering your ears. Here's a famous demo of the effect you may have heard to demonstrate it. Be sure to put on headphones before listening though, since it doesn't work otherwise. Now, as I begin the clipping, and I bring the clippers closer to your ear, very closer to the right ear. Follow me as I move around the back of the head to the left ear. We've seen this before in games such as Hellblade and Corpse Party, but Resident Evil 2 specifies real-time generation, suggesting that the audio is manipulated to simulate this effect. It works surprisingly well in the game, even if it only seems to apply to certain sound effects. The other cool feature then is the option to use classic sound effects in music. Enable this, and well, these are the results. Annoyingly, this feature is locked behind the Deluxe Edition, but it's only 10 bucks more, so I suppose it's not a huge deal, as it does come with various other costumes and features as well. But back in 1998, this would have just been a free unlockable within the game. Now at this point, we could continue walking through the game, but I'd like to showcase a few random sections from the remake compared to the PS1 originals. So, on to Chapter 3. There's a lot of memorable sequences in the original Resident Evil 2, and the developers at Capcom had to figure out ways in which to deliver these sequences in the new game. Sometimes this involves upending expectations, other times it's about redesigning a concept to work within the new framework. Case in point, one of the most intense moments involves this guy. He even showed up in the commercials for this game back in the 90s. And in the remake, well, it's a simple sequence involving running towards the camera while staying out of his way. With a stronger RE4 influence, this may have been a QTE sequence, but instead, players retained full control throughout. It looks fantastic in the remake as well, with an interactive water mesh that sloshes around violently, along with some impressive animation work. Speaking of the creatures, I noticed that certain enemies, such as the crows here, or the giant spiders, have gone missing in the remake, and I can kind of understand why. For instance, the crows, I don't think they would have worked very well with the manual aiming system. On the other hand, the larger G-type creatures are very much in the game, and they're disgusting. These complex creatures exhibit rich animation with lots of individual moving parts. The sewer section in general is greatly expanded here with a more complicated layout and additional puzzles to solve, but it's the atmosphere that has shifted the most. I'm almost reminded of games such as Bloodborne, as a result of the darkness and decay scattered about everywhere. Key characters from the original return as well, with improvements to rendering quality, while sometimes exhibiting new outfits. Ada's first appearance has her wearing this rather long coat with a pair of sunglasses, but later on, the famous red dress does make an appearance, though many of the sequences involving Ada have changed significantly in the new remake. Her gameplay sections are still present as well, but again, they feature pretty significant changes. It's significantly longer than the comparable sections in the original release. Another cool sequence then, in the original, when visiting the interrogation room, the mirror reflects your character model. Well, that's been recreated in the new game with a proper real-time reflection effect. It's rendered at quarter resolution it seems, and lacks post-processing, but it's impressive and surprising to see. I feel it demonstrates the developer's attention to detail during the development of Resident Evil 2. So how about another location, the library? It's been completely redesigned with a new puzzle. You need to lower the stuck shelf here and create a bridge in order to cross the upper level. By doing so, you gain access to the third floor balcony area, which leads to the clock tower area. 
another spot that has been completely redesigned with a new puzzle and visual design. Then there's this area just outside the station. The remake features a nice rain effect and a modified layout, and I think it looks great. Honestly, at this point, I could just go on and on with these comparisons, but I don't want to spoil everything, and thankfully there is a lot more than what I've shown here. The key here is that the entire game world has been crafted with a remarkable attention to detail, while also introducing smart changes to the overall design. It's both familiar yet entirely new, and it works beautifully. What I find most fascinating about the game is how it manages to somehow create a perfect Resident Evil experience, something the series has struggled to achieve over the years. It pulls everything the series has become known for together into one coherent whole. Take the combat, for instance. It's a fusion of classic Resident Evil with Resident Evil 4. You have a third-person over-the-shoulder perspective like 4, but enemies are tougher, ammo is much more limited, and items such as knives can break with use. That's right, while the knife functions like Resident Evil 4, it is a temporary item that can be used up, so make sure you use it strategically. The most important element then comes back to core progression through the game. I was worried that this would be dumbed down, but that's not the case at all. The game world itself is large, and puzzle solutions are often spread out across the entire map. You really need to explore and learn the layout while keeping track of everything. In fact, it's actually more complex than the original game. Thankfully, the map function now keeps track of item locations, but that doesn't mean things are easier since you'll need to plan out each excursion. This is what survival horror is all about. When venturing out into the map, you'll need to consider whether you have enough ammo to deal with the liquor you know is waiting in that hallway, for instance. It's all about making these decisions, and that's what I love about Resident Evil. All of this is then backed by a very capable technology with the RE engine. The quality of the rendering and animation combined with the smooth 60 frames per second performance makes a tremendous difference here. That the entire world is presented as a seamless whole with no loading points is another key victory and greatly increases the pace of the experience. Plus, unlike most versions of the original Resident Evil 2, you can skip cutscenes at any point which makes replaying the game less tedious. Now, we've discussed a lot in this video then, but you're probably wondering about performance and image quality and other comparisons between the different consoles. Having spent most of my time playing on a PS4 Pro, the experience is generally excellent with a frame rate that mostly hangs onto its 60 frames per second target, though there are a few dips here and there. But there's a lot more to talk about regarding frame rate and visual quality, and you'll find all of that information in our console comparison video, which will be up shortly after this one goes live. Everything you've seen in this feature, though, was captured on a PS4 Pro with a few snippets from Xbox One X thrown in for good measure. If you're trying to decide between the X and the Pro, they're both good, though they each have their own flaws, but if you're looking at Xbox One or base PS4, you might want to wait and see what we find in our other video. But that about wraps things up. Resident Evil 2 delivers everything I had hoped for and more. This might be the finest remake ever released by any company. In fact, it's so good that it's quickly become a top three game in the Resident Evil series for me. It's clear that the development team fully understands what makes this series so great to begin with. But that's all from me for the moment. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, ring that notification bell, and follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, be sure to stock up on those green herbs.